welcome. Welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy and proud that we uh, can introduce Dr. Lei Zhang to you. Uh, Lei is a um, cognitive computational neuroscientist uh, working at the University of, uh, uh, of Vienna. He did his PhD uh, um, not in Vienna, though, but in Hamburg in the lab of uh, Jan Glacier, and then worked in uh, various uh, uh, various in institutions. Uh, he has uh, uh, published widely in the field of uh, um, uh, cognitive neuroscience with publications in social cognitive and affective neuroscience, neuron plus biology. So uh, I'm I'm very uh, happy that he was willing to give this uh, lecture on, uh, let's say, an intersection of two topics that that uh, is is of interest to uh, a couple of us, and that's on the one hand Stan, which we at this point do not yet teach uh, 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 students, uh, basically because we don't we're not experts ourselves, and the other topic is uh, uh, learning uh, models. Um, which quite a number of people in the in the department are uh, uh, studying, and and it's always nice to have like a uh, an expert on these models uh, telling about them. So this this conjunction of both topics makes it a very uh, topical, relevant lecture. So Lei, uh, I stop talking here. Thanks a lot, and and uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Francis, for the for the introduction, kind introduction, and thank you again for the invitation, both Francis and uh, Wolf, and also thank Kenny for getting in touch in, to uh, with me in the in the first place. Otherwise, this talk I guess would never happen. <laughs> so many delay. Um, I just sent the, the entire material of today's workshop lecture on the chat, so you can download everything. <clears throat> Today I will be um talking about. Stan first as the first in the first place, and then the risk of a learning model in the second place. So <clears throat> I am aware of that. So the KU Leuven uh, in Belgium is kind of a, a big place, a big center in terms of aversive learning and fear conditioning and pain, and also some con computational modeling. So I think it's really honor to talk to, to the audience here. Um, actually, I've been to Leuven once when I was preparing for slides and then I tried to dig into my old folders to find out if I have some good ones. Maybe this is not <laughs> one of the good ones, but when you are like quite a few years ago, 20, early 20 years old, traveling alone, don't know what to do. Um, during a selfie, this is the best I can come up with. <laughs> so, this is um, <clears throat> me in front of the town hall, Leuven. And I also Googled a little bit because you know, the, the flag of Austria and then the flag of the, 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 the Leuven area is quite alike. And then I was confused a little bit, but then I, I thought, I Googled it, then I think it's different, just look quite um, similar. <clears throat> um, beyond that, what, what, what do I have? Some, do I have some day-to-day -day, um, Belgium connection? The answer is actually yes. So, yes. If you, if you follow me kind of a little bit on my website or to Twitter, maybe I actually ride bikes a lot. So this is my bike, a Belgian bike, uh, readily. And here there's also the proud Flanders Lyon. <laughs> That's, I'm also <laughs> pretty happy with the riding every day. Anyway, um, I'm happy to be here, even though it's online. And I hope to be there someday in, in, in person in the future. So today I will briefly talk about a few things. First of all, to basically describe what to repeat what Francis and Wolf has been talking over the semester. And then I will try to motivate you to, or to convince you why we want to model or code models in the STAN language. And then um, move on to the topic about cognitive modeling, just briefly describe what they are, what it is. And then more specifically, we will be talking about the simple risk law Wagner value update learning, in particular in the um, topic of decision making, but it can also be generalized in some other topics. And we could also talk about that uh, a little bit more later. Then in the kind of big second half of this workshop, uh, maybe I will spend quite some time of, imp to, uh, of demonstrating um, you how to implement the RISCLA Wagner model in the STAN language. So what I wanted to do is like, 
I will share my screen, of course, and then I will create, instead of showing you a pre-modeled um, script line by line, I want to really open up an empty script as if we are just really, after collecting data, now we are at the stage of modeling it, what to do. So opening the new empty script and then really to write slowly, but line by line, how to build it from scratch. But for this demonstration purpose, I will try to make it as easy, as straightforward as possible. So I will only do it for one participant, and then I will explain a little bit more how to generalize it when we have multiple participants. And also um, using the Bayesian approach, we are able to easily implement the hierarchical structure, right? So we have individual level, and on top of it, we have usually a normal Gaussian distribution where we have a group level parameter. So we can do this hierarchical version. This can also be easily implemented um, in the STAN language. <coughs> and uh, so because if you look at the description of today's um, talk, there is a, like a reference where we had a package a few years back. So we know that coding in STAN might be a little bit in, unintuitive, in, inintuitive in the first place. Uh, for a lot of people who are not really familiar with the topic. So we had a, a R package, and then there we tried to include as many as models, cognitive models as possible in a hierarchical fashion. Mo mostly learning and decision-making, but now it's, it's growing a lot. We also have some versions uh, regarding reaction time. I will only briefly talk about uh, the package. Then we could have the summary and then feel free also to ask questions. And I, 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 I anticipate that there will be a lot of questions during the talk. So just feel free to um, interrupt me at any time. You don't have to wait until the very end to ask. Okay, just as long as anything is unclear or you want to clarify or just curious, just, just feel free to stop me. <clears throat> All right, um, very briefly, because you are, knowing this already, especially for the master students you are in the course. So we, are, we have this Bayesian equation, right? And we talk about different parts of it. So we have the posterior, which is the um, distribution or the uncertainty or the knowledge of the parameter given the model uh, and also given the observed data. So after we have seen the data, what do we know about the parameter? And uh, so, uh, opposedly, if we have the posterior, we will also have the prior, so before the data collection, what we know already, um, maybe because of literature, maybe because of pilot study, so anything before the data collection, so prior distribution or prior um, probability. And we also have the likelihood on this right-hand side of the Bayes equation, which is uh, how likely our data is given different combinations or different sets of parameters. And then very lastly, we have this uh, denominator which is a little bit uh, tricky to calculate. I guess you have seen this already from your earlier exercises. So the P of D, it requires, depends on the type of the event. If that is discrete, you will have to do the summing up, like marginal probability always. And if that is um, continuous, you have to do the integral, right? So calculating this is not so easy. And if you have multiple parameters, this part is getting more and more tricky. Uh, this is also why the reason we switched to Markov chain Monte, Monte Carlo MCMC because we could get rid of the denominator. We could just simply use the property that the posterior is proportional to the product between the prior and the likelihood so that we could sample, try to sample and approximate the shape of the geometry of the parameter space uh, posterior. <clears throat> So usually, I guess, what you have seen so far or in any uh, textbook is this coin flipping example, right? So you have a resource question is how you are interested in, you have, you have a coin at hand and you are interested in whether the coin is biased or not. Biased here means it doesn't have a 50-50% chance landing head and the tail uh, facing up. It might be something else, 50 is fair, 40, 60, 80, 70, it's not fair. So you, you, you don't know, you, you, you have the coin. You don't know that if that is best or not. So what you can do in this case is, well, you do experiment, right? This is your subject and you manipulate or you want to interact with your subject. 
in a way that you flip the coin and uh, throw it into up into the air, you catch it, or just let, let, let it land freely on the ground to see if, uh, if you have a head or a tail. And you do this multiple times because you want to you, you try to get a reliable uh, result, not doing only single trial because there are a lot of randomness. So let's say uh, there is your this those are your observations. You did this um, coin flipping twenty times, and then fifteen times the head was uh, facing up, and then you are trying to get out uh, get out of. The, the posterior distribution given the data. So the data here is you have 20 trails out of the 20, 15 are the heads and the five are, are tails. And then you want to know, well, what is the degree of, flip of, of the belief about the biased parameter? Let's call it theta. So how biased is your, is your core and based on the data you have? This is a typical like Bayesian inference problem. And so usually what we can do is, if you know it already, right? So this follows the Bernoulli distribution. And what we are like graphically to illustrate this is um, using this kind of notion. So if that is circle, this continues. If that is discrete, we use square. And then if that is unobserved, this is no color shading. And if that is observed, this is colored shading. So what we have here, we have portrayal this data, right? Just one or zero, head or tail, head or tail. This is a binary and discrete variable with can call it H or head shaded because it is observed. It is a square because it is discrete. And then this uh, observation zero or one is predicted or affected um, by this bias parameter. So let's call it theta. And what we can usually write down is, well, the theta, the, the H, the head observation is distributed as Bernoulli and following the theta. And we could also think about this, there is a trial loop because we are repeating this 20 trials. And uh, because we are doing Bayesian um, inference or Bayesian parameter estimation, we also need prior distribution. In this case, we have a parameter, unknown parameter theta. We could do it um, different ways. So one way is to have a uniform prior distribution in between zero and one. So we could have a flight prior this is zero this is one but we could hope this is flat prior and we could also have something like a um, informative prior for instance it can also be a, it can be a weekly informative prior it could also be a strongly informative prior let's say we are kind of sure that um we have some belief that the coin is is unbiased but we are unsure so let's say we have something like this. It is kind of wide, but the peak is around 0.5. And then in another scenario, you could say, well, I'm really, this is bad drawing. I'm really sure that is around 50%. So then the prior distribution can be pretty precise and narrow. Then this is a strongly uh, informative prior distribution. Okay. So anyway, for this um, illustration purpose, I just use uniform and then um, and then we could talk about a little bit, so the steps of doing uh, Bayesian modeling. So I, I showed you the, the research question. We are interested in the bias parameter of the coin, and we do experiments, we collect the data, we throw, we catch, we throw, we catch, we get one, zero, one, zero, head, tail, head, tail. And uh, then there is the, the Bernoulli distribution usually supposedly to be able to describe that process. But, but what is that? What is the abstract level? How to describe these things? What is the first procedure? So why you are thinking? So what is the procedure that you come up with a process that you think that could describe the process? So that is actually related to the very first step of doing Bayesian modeling or any modeling. It doesn't have to be Bayes at all. So the very first thing is to come up with a data generating process, the data story. So how come your data might just arise, right? If in our case, we, we think there is a coin, there is underlying parameter governing the head or tail observation, each trial. So then this, um, and then each uh, throw up and uh, catch follows the theta and is independently across all of the 20 trials, there's no dependency. So this is our, data story, right? How your data might arise, how your data might, um, might have be generated. So 
the data generating process. And when you have that, in our case, this, uh, this can be a Bernoulli distribution or Bernoulli likelihood function. We let data come in. So we have our data and we use the data, we use the observation to um, update our belief regarding the bias given a Bernoulli function. And afterwards, we do fitting, and we, after every 20 trials, after every trials out of the 20 trials, they are considered. We are able to generate a, uh, or to compute a posterior distribution. And we could also use the posterior predictive distribution to compare if the data and the predictions did match up, right? If they match up, this is a good model. Otherwise, you might come up with another data story. And then maybe this one is better, maybe that is worse. Then there's another topic about model comparison. And this, this is a little bit out of the scope today, but then you know the process. And then you come up with multiple um, candidate data stories, do the comparison, find out the best one, and then you will base your following up analysis on the best model. <clears throat> Good. Um, so for this simple um, Bernoulli example, Maybe I guess you did it also in the class is like you can solve it actually. You don't even need to use MCMC to solve this rather straightforward and simple problem. So we could solve it by grid approximation. So as I said a little bit earlier, depends on the type of the parameters. So if that is a discrete parameter, you can just write down the denominator, expand it, the marginal distribution to be a summing up problem. So otherwise, if you have a continuous parameter, then what you can do is to do an integral. And we know that integral is kind of a little bit tricky to do, and we don't want to do it. So what we can do, or what people usually do, is to divide the parameter space, the continuous parameter space, into um, fine steps. So for example, if we have a 0, 1 space, it's continuous. And what we can do is we just divide the continuous uh, space into small steps. So for instance, 0, 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, then until like it is one. So this continuous problem is converted into a discrete problem. So instead of calculating the integral, we could calculate the sum, right? To uh, calculate the posterior distribution. So here as an illustration example, we have a continuous curve, the blue line, and then we take small steps. And then if we take all of the lines, we connect them, it will be kind of an approximation to the original curve. And it depends on how large your step is. So if you have an even smaller step, the red line will be uh, even more closer, even much closer to the original blue curve. OK. <clears throat> this is good so far. And this works for one parameter. But what if we have? multiple parameters, right? So the entire grid approximation, it will um, increase from maybe one dimension to two dimension. You have a 2D space. When you, when you are doing this, this is usually, you end up with a huge nested loop, right? For one parameter, you loop it from the first step to the last one and like a inner loop, the second parameter looping from the first to the last. And then there's another one, the inner loop, even inner loop from the looping from the first to the last, like a very nested. Um, great. So this ends up with a huge computational time increase. And usually, uh, if you if you have three, four, five parameters, that still work just slow. And if you have even more parameters, usually this just doesn't work for computers. The memory doesn't handle this well. So let's say if you're interested, maybe if we have two parameters, the denominator looks like this. If you have 10 or 100, it looks pretty huge, right? You don't want to solve it. You really do not want to solve it. But in some other scenario, it's like, well, this is still solvable. You just need to need time to solve it. But in some other cases, the, the, the analytical solution of the denominator or the posterior, it doesn't exist. It doesn't. It's so complex. It's so complicated that it doesn't even it, that it doesn't even exist. So you can't solve it. Can't find it. And then in this case, I guess then this uh, kind of trouble or challenge or issue motivated us to use um, the Markov chain Monte Carlo because you see most of the challenge it lies in the computation or the calculation of the denominator. But the denominator 
if you think about the purpose, why we have the P of B in the first place, it only serves as a normalizing purpose, right? It is to make sure the posterior, if you take the area, the area and the curve, it sum up to one. And if you do not normalize it, it doesn't really um, qualify as a probability distribution. It only serves as a normal, normalizing or normalization purpose. It doesn't do much. It doesn't change the shape. So if that doesn't do much, we just get rid of it, right? We can drop it. We drop the denominator. So we take the property that the posterior is proportional to the multiplication between prior and likelihood. So this is what uh, Markov G Monte Carlo is trying to take advantage of. And use, this use this property to approximate the shape of the, the posterior. So Markov G Monte Carlo is a, a family of methods, and uh, you've covered about uh, the, some different methods during the previous lectures in, in the class um, by Francis and uh, Wolf, especially Jacks, I think, I believe. And then today we will be talking about something a little bit different. So we will talk about the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. I will skip all of the details because talking about the algorithm of the sampler might take two hours, and I will just tell you how to use it. And at HMC, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is the one Stan is implementing. So Stan, it, it is a language by itself. It can be communicated with different software um, platforms or interface. You can call it from R. So then there's the R Stan implication application. If you call it from Python, there's the Py Stan. If you use MATLAB, there's also Matt Stan. You don't even need an interface to call it, right? You could just call it from your terminal. If you use Mac, Linux, you are familiar with the black terminal, the, the bash thing. You can actually call Stan from there. And then that is called command Stan, CMD, command Stan. There are also more interfaces. There's a new language called Julia. Maybe you heard about that. So Julia Stan is also possible. And uh, here, uh, if you are, really a Python guy, a Python person. So there is another one, which also implements HMC, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, um, called PyMC3. The most advanced version is so far PyMC4, but I think it's kind of still in, in beta version. So they are testing that. PyMC3 is pretty developed already in terms of the efficiency and the performance, I guess, pretty much. Um, equivalent between these two pi and c3 and stan. But anyway, we will be talking about stan in the remainder of the talk. OK, this is kind of a 15 minutes um, summary of what, what we have learned from the past. So any <laughs> problems here? I stop a little bit. Questions? Anything you want to know, want to ask? I think it, I think it was a a very nice uh, overview and I hope um, I was thinking regularly well for the students in the master class they, they, they must have thought well we've heard these terms and 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 now ah, yeah you can you can see it that way as well so it's also nice that someone else then explains it um, in, in in this way so I hope uh, it was also useful uh, to them to connect some of the things that were spread out over the whole semester I think thanks it was a nice overview. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear. Yeah, thank you. All right. So then we, we move on to something a little different. <laughs> so let's talk about that. So um, before I talk, talk about the details, I, I, as I said, I will skip the technical details, but I will tell you some of the advantage and also disadvantage relative to JAX, for example. And I will also tell you about who is using Stan most of, most of the time. But first of all, maybe you heard about Stan, so why, why I'm here to tell you about this, because it's kind of getting popular, right? And uh, if you check the paper, so Stan originally, it is developed 2012, 2013, I think. And uh, then the paper really came out a, little, a few years later. So 2017, so the preprint was earlier, I think 2016, but the paper was eventually published 2017. And after that, we see the, the, the citation number get increased a lot. And then this year, this like May only, it will be here more or less, I guess. And then total, you see is nearly 4,000 times of citation. It's, it's a lot. 
And uh, but knowing 3,000 or 4,000, it doesn't really help much, right? Because we want to see comparison. So if you look at JAX, JAX is the, let's consider that as a previous version of how we implement MCMC for modeling. It has more, right? 4,500, but it takes nearly 20 years to get this number. And here is five years less, right? Less than five years. And this will eventually be even more. So more and more people are using that. <clears throat> But who are using that? If you check the citation on, on the Web of Science uh, website, you could actually see the subfields of who are using STEM. So STEM itself, it is a probabilistic language. So it's not surprising that well, the stats person, the statisticians, uh, the stats, the probability theory people, <laughs> I don't know how to call it, probability theory people. So they are using that a lot, not so surprising. And college is a lot. This is a little bit surprising. I don't know. I didn't know that. And multidisciplinary science, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so everyone's using that. Here's interesting. This part are, are interesting for us. It's neuroscience and psychology, experimental psychology. I believe this, this, this qualifies who you are, who I am, and um, a lot of people in this audience. And then if you think about more psychology, this is also here. Psychology, multidisciplinary, I also don't know what I mean. <laughs> as long as there is a questionnaire, you could say, well, <laughs> psychology, multidisciplinary. And here also mathematical psychology. It's, these can also be grouped together, right? You can just call it psychology. Then this will be a larger number, even more than this, I think. So it's good for us, right? So we are not really under the small corner that only uh, a handful of people or handful of people paper are using it. There's a lot, a lot of pe pe people are using that as a tool um, to analyzing, to analyze their, their data using this approach. So it's getting more and more accepted and getting more and more recognized and getting more and more appreciated in the, in the field. So then um, talking or comparing STEM with JAX or also like earlier the BAX language. Um, so one, I think for me is like when I, I also had some exper some experience with with Jax one year more or less, and I was a little bit unhappy and switched. So one reason is uh, in Jax, I think I really always have to run a lot of samples, maybe twenty thousand, one hundred thousand, even one million samples if I can run it on the server, and I thin it a lot. So the the reason to do the thinning, if you remember the concept of thinning. Uh, thinning equals to one means I take, I can draw, try to draw a little bit. So if, if this is a MCMC sample, the chain kind of. So if thinning equals one, we take all the samples um, from the estimation to do the posterior. And if thinning equals two, we take the first and then the third and then the fifth and the seventh, right? Every second sample, we take it. So if thinning equals three, we take every third sample. And uh, if thinning equals 1,000, we just take every 1,000 sample, right? We take the first and then 1,001 and 2,001. So why, why we are doing this? Is it, it is because the spatial correlation, so the spatial correlation of the samples, they are high. So two samples, if they are correlated, they do not provide independent contribution to the estimation of the posterior. posterior. So two samples, maybe effectively, they are equivalent to 1.5, 1.3 samples. They are specially correlated. If they are not correlated, then two samples, they are two samples because they are independent of each other. But we also know that, well, because it's a Markov process, you can't really get rid of the dependency. It's, otherwise, it is not a Markov process anymore. So there are somehow at least some uh, dependencies. It's just there is a quantification to say, well, how much correlation you can accept is how much you can just get rid of. But anyway, so in earlier versions of JAX, the spatial correlation is quite an issue so that we have to thin a lot to, rather than taking every single sample, we take every 10th, every 100th, every 1,000th sample. Um, in STAN, it doesn't have to, you, you, we usually don't have to do this because um, there will be some read, reading materials. I think it's part of uh, the, the slides. So it is efficient and there's uh, less a consider Less, it is less an issue regarding the spatial correlation. So it ends up with more effective samples. You don't have to thin a lot. You just run maybe 1,000, 2,000 samples. You take every sample and uh, re, uh, instead of trying to thin it a lot. 
So this is one kind of the motivation. And some others, I guess, is about um, um, <clears throat> the, the time, right? Because I guess you heard about stands faster. And faster is not this precise quantification to compare the two languages. So sometimes Jax is even faster. Maybe Jax is two minutes, then three minutes. Jax is faster, right? But more precise or more um, fair comparison regarding the time is the, the, the runtime per effective sample. So per effective sample, how long it takes. So maybe um, Jax is two seconds, stands three seconds, but out of the two seconds for Jax, the effective sample is 100 out of 2000. But the other one, three seconds, even though it's longer, but maybe it's 500 out of 500, out of 2000, right? So it's more um, effective samples per time unit or less time per uh, effective sample size. It doesn't matter how you how calculate it. So in terms of this time to converge per effective sample size, this is faster, not only the absolute time. At, at least as the same, the same as Jax. So maybe the same and mostly faster. And more of a consideration is actually the memory usage because I think I never run, try to run a Jax model on my own computer because my computer was quite old. It, it never really worked pretty well and it, it consumes a lot of memory and uh, I have to switch to a server. And luckily we had a good server and I, can, and I was able to run it. But instead, I, most, of the, most of the time I can actually run it on my laptop because the, the memory usage is a lot reduced. So maybe 1% relative to Jax in, for, some earlier, for some easier models. And for complex models, which requires a lot of memory, it's even, uh, it is also quite reduced, maybe 10%. This is a good um, reason or motivation that a lot of people are using Stan. It's more efficient, the two reasons here, and uh, less memory consumption. <clears throat> And uh, so maybe you say, well, you have a server. It's, you rent overnight. The next morning you come here and it doesn't matter. I think 1,000 times I can wait. I, I don't mind, right? So maybe this is not a good motivation. And then there's some other more interesting uh, practical motivations, at least it works for me. So when I was trying to overwrite, when I, in the beginning, I didn't know how Jax works. I, tr I was trying to overwrite a variable. So usually if you do it in R, right? a equals four and then equals five, a will just be overwritten. It will not be five anymore. It will, be not, it will not be four anymore. It will become five. You can just simply overwrite it. In, in Jax, you can't do this because it doesn't allow you to overwrite. So sometimes in the model, you need some helping variables. You don't really need it. You just need it there to help you as an intermediate transition step. You don't even need to analyze it. But Maybe you say, well, I want to overwrite it because I want to reuse it. I don't need it. I just use it for a helping variable, but it doesn't really allow you to do this. Instead, you can do this. You can really overwrite a variable. That's quite of a good thing for me at least. Well, the counter argument could be overwriting might be risky because you never know if, if that is correctly overwritten or not. But as long as you are careful enough, you check what is going on then overwriting is not bad on itself. And then uh, if the, the, the control flow is a little bit struggling in the beginning in, uh, in Jax because there is the if else, but if else together, right? If else, and uh, if that's true, then the second statement, if false, then the third statement. There's not really an if else, else if, and a more uh, if else control flow. There's not a formal control flow in Jax. Maybe in the newer version they have, I'm not sure, but when I was using that still, it doesn't, didn't have the control flow. But instead, it has the, uh, the formal control flow if else. It is exactly the same as the syntax of R. So if you know how if else works in R already, you just really don't have to learn, uh, put extra work to learn uh, the if else. <clears throat> this is a really good thing because we have conditions, right? Sometimes you say, well, if the reaction time is less than 300 milliseconds, you want to do something. And if the reaction time is above 300 milliseconds, you want to do something else. And then, and then if you have say, well, if the reaction time is above three seconds, 3000 milliseconds, there is another else if. 
there are three conditions. This case is much flexible in the STEM language. And some other thing to even support the efficiency is STEM has a full support of vectorization and matrix calculation. So whatever you know regarding matrix calculation and then to uh, transpose and then to do the matrix multiplication and if you know how that works, this is very well fully support in the STEM language. And there are more than what I can say. So here's a link and you could uh, easily click on it. There is a discussion regarding why people are like more uh, excited about using STEM. And I'll show you one example here, try to convince you a little bit more. So let's say, let's look at here first. We have um, a two-dimensional marginal space out of a 250-dimensional normal. So in, in the end, it's a higher dimensional thing, but we are only looking at the, the first two, or maybe just let's say the first two of it, the marginal irre irrespective of the other two 48 dimensions. So let's say this is our true space and we want to sample from it, right? So eventually what you want to have, if the sampler is sufficient and efficient enough, the sampler will just basically, this is MCMC, you, you will, the sampler will just travel everywhere um, according to the distribution, right? In the middle, it will travel more and then in the this edge area, it doesn't travel much. Essentially, it will do that, that's very good. Then we are looking for a sampler that can do this. So can all of the sampler do this? And the answer is not always. So let's say, well, for this metropolis sampling, it just stuck here. It doesn't really uh, explore the full area. It gets stuck here. And for this Gibbs, Gibbs sampling that is uh, in JAX, so it, it does well here. Most of the case when the, where the density is high, this is pretty equivalent right here. But uh, this is kind of okay, but the other side doesn't, doesn't really travel too. But for this one, the nuts, nuts is the more specific, this is name, basically you, you think this is Stan, right? Stan is implementing HMC, but HMC is using a specific algorithm called no U-turns, Never mind, just, just terms, Stan, okay, this is Stan, <laughs> this is Stan. And Stan does well. So comparing the Stan sampling versus the original one. If you look at here, if I clear, clear what I draw. So if you compare this one and then this one, it looks pretty good. So this achieved the goal where we want to have a good sampler. It travels according to distribution rather than stacking at this particular location. And even more uh, consideration is actually here. So for, for Stan, we use 1000 samples. We didn't thin it. And at the other one, look at here, we tried this graph this graph for both. It is 1 million sample and thinned uh, by 1,000. So it's taking every 1,000 already. It is already trying to skip the spatial correlation part, but in the end, it is still quite spatially correlated. So in this case, when the geometry of the parameter space is highly complex or high dimensional, it doesn't work well for the previous samplers, but Stan can solve it. For simpler examples, maybe just binomial Bernoulli, I wouldn't say there's a huge difference. Really, I wouldn't say that. Use JAX, use STEM, doesn't really matter. But for complex models, there is clearly the uh, advantage of using the HMC STEM. All right. Well, enough motivation, I guess. So practically, as I said, um, STEM itself, it is a language. We call it from R. So we interact STEM with the R language. So and usually in analysis, what we can do is we prepare two scripts. One is your main analysis, R script. The other one is your STAN model script. So here in the R script, you prepare all of the data and then send it to STAN. And then you, stand, you write a STAN model story, right? You use STAN language to write a Bernoulli, a write a linear regression, write a risk Wagner, whatever. Then the model is there. And the send, you prepare and then send data to STEM. And STEM does the, the heavy work, HMC sampling. And whenever the sampling work is finished, it will return the samples back to R. And then in R, we are more comfortable with, we will then draw, uh, uh, we will do statistics and draw inference using those samples, posterior samples from, from the STEM language. Good. So it talks about a lot of advantage of 
of STEM, and you might wonder, well, it's good, but um, I also want to be fair. So is there any disadvantages or cons of using STEM? There are a few, honestly. So first of all, it's kind of a little bit conceptual. It's, it does provide uh, improvement in terms of computational efficiency, but a lot of the times people um, complain that the mathematical foundation is a little bit too difficult to, to follow, at least sometimes. This is one. Maybe this doesn't harm, right? If you don't care, then you can just use it. So this one, this one hurts a, a bit. So the second is like stand cannot sample from posterior distribution of discrete parameters. So if you have a parameter that takes values of only one, two, three, or one, two, or zero, one binary parameter, discrete parameter, this doesn't work. JAX doesn't have this issue. So if you have a discrete parameter, JAX works better. But can we get rid of it? But the answer is with some additional effort, you have to know how to deal with it. It can be achieved through marginalization. And then there is a nice summary in the stand user manual regarding how to marginalize a continuous parameter to be a discrete parameter. And you can take a look at that part. And then the third one is more about uh, style and then tips. So there, there is a stand manual, this of course, but uh, maybe it's so far not yet so user-friendly. Some of the chapters is not so straightforward to follow what they are talking about, but there are users and then they come up with different tips and tricks regarding how to model, how to write a specific stand model, but this is not included or integrated into the stand menu. So there are some kind of unwritten trips and tricks, tips and tricks. You know it, you know it, otherwise you can't find it anywhere. And uh, the best approach, I guess, is you can try on your first, in the first place, and you get a lot of errors and mistakes. Then there's the STEM forum. You can ask questions, post your script with mistakes, and also post the error messages. And then there are people that try to help you. And then through the way, I guess, from the discussion with other people, you will be able to accumulate more and more tips and tricks using STEM. I can tell you a little bit from my uh, experience these trips and ticks later, but in general, it's a lot. <laughs> and then it's better that you make mistakes first. It's not bad. You make mistakes and then ask people to correct you. Those are really valuable information. And lastly, um, because so if we are knowing JAX, we know that we can really easily shift the places, uh, shift chunks of the codes in the in the JAX place. So. One example is you could define your prior distribution at the bottom. Some people are doing that a lot. I used to do this also. But some people, they define the prior distribution at the beginning of the script. It doesn't matter. It's pretty flexible. You can just change it. But instead, this, there's no this kind of flexibility. This is a block-based language. So it follows something like this. I will show you later when I'm uh, demonstrating you the code. But essentially, you have to write down the data part, where you define the known part, what is known, what is your observation, and then the parameter block, where you define what is your unknown parameter, in our case, the bias of the coin, and then later the likelihood part. So how you want to connect the pieces, the data part, what is known, the parameter part, what is unknown, and then you connect this tool in the likelihood um, fashion in the model block. So here to just complete the picture, we have a, a coin tosing example. Graphically, it looks like this. We have the distributions, the prior the likelihood, and uh, it is equivalent to the implementation in the stand language. Don't worry about the detail. I will tell you later in the risk wagner model uh, with more details. And essentially, there are mo uh, multiple blocks. So for the three that we, we saw, and they are the at least the, the, the minimum requirement. You at least have to declare or to define what is the data part, right? What is your observation? What is the data? You at least have to tell us then what is the parameter that is to be estimated. You at least have to tell us then how they are connected. What is, what is your likelihood function? And then here in the model block, which is usually the, the meat, the core part of a stem, um, uh, script or a stand model. That is the, the model part. Good. Any any questions at this point? It's already nearly one hour. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can how much I can finish. Uh, 
Okay, all good. That's good. So then this is brief. Um, so what is what is cognitive modeling or computational cognitive modeling? Essentially, we are trying to model what the cognitive process. And it seems like, well, maybe we're never hearing about computational modeling in the field of psychology or cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience. It seems new, but it's actually never new because in physics, it's been there for a few hundred years, right? So like physicists, like uh, they are trying to understand how the, the planet is traveling around the earth. This might not be true nowadays, but those are models, right? It's either here in this kind of trajectory or here. It's, those are models and those are already computational models. So here they are trying to explain physical um, phenomenon or physical events. But what we are trying to do is perhaps mental or cognitive process, cognitive tasks. So in an in a, in a, in a, in a illustration, what we can imagine is this, we ask, we have people to do tasks and we either observe behavior or brain data or whatever, eye tracking, EEG, uh, nearest, F nearest data, doesn't matter, just data. And then we try to understand um, the, the cognitive process through behavior. But this might not be so easy. And then what we can do um, on the other hand, or alternatively is, or maybe in addition to the traditional, more traditional behavior analysis, we can come up with cognitive models with the hope that the model could approximate more or less um, the behavior of the participants. And then if the model, the, if this, oops, if the prediction, if the data generated from the model could uh, match or resemble the patterns in the behavior, we could say, well, this is perhaps a good approximation to what might be going on in the brain. It's a really rough idea of and cognitive models. You don't really have to differentiate cognitive model versus statistical model. You really don't have to make this, this distinction. They're just models. And um, maybe some of them, they're trying to have a, a more cognitive process underlying it. It's more, more about categories. So doesn't you really don't have to distinguish the two, just models. And then actually this is this very short part of cognitive model as, as a bridge. So transitioning from more statistical topic to more psychological or cognitive topic. So one of the helpful cognitive models in the, in the literature is the so-called Ries-Clavagno. So finally, I'm coming to this point, <laughs> Ries-Clavagno model. And uh, I will go a little bit slower, I think. So here is like, why, why we are using that? Or maybe for what kind of data uh, experiment, for what kind of data pattern, for what kind of experimental design we could be able to implement the risk of Wagner, or in other words, in what scenarios we could use the risk of Wagner model as an analytical tool to understand behavior, right? So usually, um, we, well, traditionally, it is from Pavlovian conditioning, but uh, kind of from a more much modern perspective, people use like decision-making tasks. And then in this particular case, we have a, a two-armed bandit task. Essentially, if you're like uh, going to kind of casino, then there are two bandit machines or slot machines. And uh, let's say the two slot machines, they are not equally awarding, rewarding. So one of them, if you play it maybe 100 times, it will give you money more often maybe 70% of the time. The other one, maybe it doesn't give you money more often or eventually less often. Perhaps 100 per, uh, times if you play it, on average, 20 or 10% you will get reward. Otherwise, you don't get anything, right? So essentially, one is a good one. If you play it, you get more money. The other one is not a good one, the bad one. If you play it, you don't really get much. Maybe you lose because you have to insert the coins to you play, you insert money, you pay something, you don't get anything, you are just net, you, you're losing money. Now the question is, you have two options in front of you, you don't know, right? I, I told you which one's good, one's bad, but I didn't tell you which is good, which is bad. So how are you gonna solve this? So the best approach is perhaps you play with it. You just make some actions and then you observe what the consequence is. And then you will be able to use the consequence or feedback to educate yourself, to uh, work out which is better, which is worse in the long run. So here, 
And a simple task also using the laboratory is already the one I kind of described to you. So there will be a repeat, repeated choice between n options here and equals two. We, we, will, we will repeatedly make choices between the two options left and right. And then after making the choice, we will be able to observe the outcome or consequence. Either we win money or we didn't win. Or maybe the other case is if you are doing conditioning in this audience, and um, if you choose one option, you get shocks, right? There will be this kind of fear conditioning thing. CS plus, CS minus, both of the terms, they, they apply here, the same thing. And uh, we learn uh, the property of the options through trial and error, right? Because you don't know which is better, which is worse, which is rewarding, which is not, which is more um, threatening, threatening or versus which is not. So if you learn this through trial and error, you make action, observe the feedback, and then use the feedback to improve your future decisions or future actions. And then you have a goal in mind, which is in this particular case is to win as much money as you could, or maybe in the fear learning case, when you are avoiding aversive learning case, the goal is to avoid shocks as much as possible. You do not want to choose the, 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 the option that is associated with shocks. You want to choose the safe option. Good. And then the strategy is already as I more or less mentioned. So before you are making a choice, maybe after a few trials, you act, you observe, and then you update yourself. And then in the middle of the trial, after 10, let's say, you already could formulate somehow how valuable each option is. And then before making the next, the next action, before making the next choice, you will use your knowledge updated from your history, learning history, and then to decide which one you want to choose. So essentially you are predicting the value of the next trial. So in the next uh, trial, before making a choice, I'm predicting maybe the left is more valuable, left is uh, this one is more valuable, the right one is less. So I will maybe more like more likely, I will be more likely to choose the one I think is with higher value. This is the cho choosing part. So I predict the value and then I make the choice accordingly. And then again, to learn uh, from the output outcome to update the predictions. And then this kind of strategies or steps can actually be this decomposed into uh, a few decision steps. So they, in the kind of uh, influential literature here from 2008, uh, they are describing the decision problems into multiple steps. So the, first of all, you are trying to represent the problem you are about to solve. So if I place you in a learning environment, you maybe you don't know what to do. And then gradually you will find out, well, I'm supposed to earn money. I'm supposed to avoid shocks. I'm supposed to go to the top of the mountain if I'm if I'm if I'm hiking, right? Those are the goals. Those are the action that you are supposed to do. Figuring out what you are supposed to do in a new environment, and then in experimental setups, this relies heavily relies on the instructions. So we as experimenters we tell the participants what they are supposed to do. So this is the the representation part, and then whenever they figure out what they are supposed to do, well, earn money in that case, they evaluate the two options, which is good, which is bad. In the beginning, maybe randomly, because they have no idea at all, but through learning gradually, they will find out which is more valuable, which is not. And then using those values, they will make the actions. After the action, they will observe outcomes associated with that action. And then the outcome, the action will be used to, um, to direct the learning, to improve future behavior. And then here it goes to the valuation because the learning will change the valuation of the two choice options then goes on and on and graphically if you are familiar with the reinforcement learning literature and this is for more or less the same so there's the participants or the agent and then the agent makes action and then the action to the environment which is the which is the, the, the experimental setup this will result in some um, outcomes so the action will result in either a win or a loss, for example. And those are from the participant's perspective, observations. And then using the observation, they will uh, make some new actions. And then this also goes on uh, with the goal in mind to, again, win money or avoid shocks. <clears throat> so 
usually we don't really show participants those kind of um, slot machine pictures because as a stimuli, they as a stimulus, they are maybe too visually rich. There are so many distractions. So usually what we do is like we show people abstract symbols, either um, this kind of fractals or some really just abstract symbols. I think experimental in uh, experiments in in in, uh, in Europe and in the US, they like to use Chinese and Japanese characters. <laughs> I, I always find it funny because I know what it means, but uh, maybe these two other people, they are abstract symbols. But anyway, abstract symbols, those are just the two slot machines, right? One is more rewarding, the other one is not. And at the beginning, you don't know which is more rewarding, which is not, then what you do, you make an action. After choosing blue, for instance, you will see a reward or punishment. You get a win or a loss if you choose blue. And if you get a win, so maybe you're just more likely to choose blue again because this is rewarding. You are more likely to repeat the previously successful option. But then you also know that everything is probabilistic. Even though this is getting a win in the first time, maybe the next time this will give me a loss. So maybe you, you want to also uh, explore the possible outcomes of the other option. So you see here there are different strategies. But anyway, let's say you repeat your previously successful option, you choose gluten again, and then this time you get a little bit unlucky, you get a loss uh, in this case. But maybe let's say as one experimenter, we know uh, the process follows 80-20 uh, reward schedule, meaning the, 20, the, eight, the, 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 the blue option, if you choose it on average, you get reward 80% of the time. And then the yellow option, if you choose it um, on average, you get reward 20% of the time. So they are complementing. So the P of reward of this and the P of reward of this, the probability, they sum up to one. You can also do the other version so they do not sum up to one, it doesn't matter. As long as one is high, one is low. Okay. So what are the procedures in this case? The, the task is, is perhaps the simplest, in, simplest one you can come up with. So there are three stages or three phases. So one is the choice presentation. You show participants we show participants the choice. They know what they're supposed to do. They win money, they make a choice, and then they see the outcome, right? And then in this case, if you are doing this experiment and then you ask people to come in, they make the actions. And so think about it, think about it a little bit. What kind of data can we observe, right? If you have a text, text fail, text fail, or a CSV fail with subject ID 101, trial ID 1 to 100, for instance what you can measure. So think about it for five seconds. If you want to type it in the chat, you can just also feel free to do so. So we have choices, right? We don't have much, uh, nothing. We, ha we have nothing but the choice choices of, the, of each trial of uh, each participant. We have the person choosing either left or right. We can code it perhaps as one and two, one for left, one for right. And what else we have? do we have? We have the associated outcome, right? If I choose one, I get a win in this trial. Win can be coded as one. And if I got a loss, I can code it as a minus one, right? One and a minus one. So essentially we have the choices and the outcome per person as a, in a table. And we could also have re reaction times. And this is a little bit uh, not the topic here, but we could be able to have reaction times if we are really doing this experiment. So imagine if we have a data table, we have subject ID and then trial ID and then choices, one, two, one, two, and then outcome one minus one, one minus one, right? And uh, when you have the data, before you try to model that, so what um, aspect you could be able to look at to analyze the behavior? So with this data, you could already analyze something. So you could analyze reaction times, okay, the average reaction time. But more interesting part is actually the choice accuracy. So let's say the blue one is better, more rewarding than the yellow. You could simply analyze how often out of the 100 trials, the participant is choosing the blue, right? If it is, they are choosing blue, then it's accurate. If they are choosing yellow, that's inaccurate. inaccurate. So this way you could easily calculate the accuracy of the choice. So maybe some people after 100 trials, they still didn't figure out which is better, which is worse. Their accuracy is 50%, not even better than chance level. But some other people, maybe they are 
smart enough, and then they learned out that the fit worked worked out uh, the blue ones better. <clears throat> then the last thing is well, so we want to model it, right? We could have a computational process to model. To, to approximate what is the, the learning process. And then the learning process is the one I tried to um, describe a little bit uh, earlier. So it's like using the outcome to update what do you think, how valuable each choice option is, and then using the updated value to make your future choice. So those are the risk of Wagner uh, part. Okay, so here, yeah, P of choosing the correct option. Is there any, any question? Let's stop a little bit more here. <clears throat> Before I go to the to this class right now. When did you uh, plan to have a short break, maybe? Is the, that's yeah, after yeah. this this uh, section? After, I think, 10 minutes. OK. Yeah. Good. So then uh, let's come to the conceptual part of this and then we could have a break, of course, yeah. So we want to have the, the, the model of a risk of Wagner value update. And uh, usually we could divide any cognitive model into two parts. And one is the, really the cognitive part, how the value is updated using feedback. And then the other one is the observational model. So how this value is associated with the choice. So how do people rely on this strategy or not? Basically the likelihood function. And we will be focusing on here uh, a lot because this is the, the actual part of the risk of Agna. So this is originally like came up with to explain some phenomena in Pavlovian conditioning. So um, by the two actually psychologists at risk of Wagner. And the idea, the simple idea is this is error driven learning. So in like human language, let's say the expectation on the next trial, so expectation or the value in the future equals to the expectation at the current moment, multiply uh, plus, so updated by a learning rate weighted prediction error. Then the question is what is a prediction error, right? So credit, prediction error is the difference between what you actually get and what you think you will get. So if you think I will get, if you think that tomorrow it will be sunny, and then if it's raining, you want, if, if I want to go to a bike ride, and then if I think uh, tomorrow it's sunny, but it gets rain, then this is a negative prediction error because the consequence is worse than I thought. But if I say, well, I didn't plan to have a ride, I think tomorrow it will be raining, but then it's shining outside, then it is better than I think. Perhaps I will just go to have a ride. Right? So basically, prediction error is either just positive or negative. It's better than what you think or worse than you think. If it is better than you think, you increase the value of it. If it is worse than you think, it will be decreased uh, in, in terms of the valuation. So the simple idea is like this. But uh, in the uh, equation, usually what you see in the paper is, well, prediction error equals, just as I told you, the difference between the, the actual consequence and what you think it will happen, your prediction, your expectation. And then the, the prediction error will be used to update the value. So the new, new value equals the old value plus a learning rate multiplied with the prediction error, okay? So all of them are variables. The R here, this, R, this is the real data. It's you either get a win or a loss, perhaps. And then the value is the internal variable, is the value. PE is the calculation, is the resulting one. And the V is the V, did the same V. So the, the only free parameter here, like the bias in the coin example, the only free parameter is alpha one. So this is the learning rate. And then using this, if, you're, if we are feeding the model to the data, we get a posterior distribution of the alpha parameter, right? So um, how, the, how the learning rate works. So essentially, if let's say, if we have a learning rate of 0.9, and then we simply could, plug in all of the numbers in this, into this equation. We could imagine the initial value of the two choice options, both of them, they are zero because before learning, you have no idea. You just think uh, the value is zero. And then according to the calculation, if you get a win, if you choose one last option, so win versus zero, this is a prediction error because it didn't predict anything. It equals zero in the first place. 
but you get a win. You have a large and a pr positive prediction error. And then the prediction error is multiplied with the learning rate. And then this is the original one. And then the original one will be updated from zero to 0.9, right? So you can do this simple calculation for a few trials for simulation. So in this case, you could see that if the learning rate is high, then it will really change a lot according to the win schedule. You see here, if you get a win, then if, or if you get multiple times of reward, 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 the value will be increased very fast and then approaching to the, the maximum, which is one. But at the same time, even though you have got, if you have observed uh, multiple times of reward, but as long as you have one negative observation, your value will be dropped a lot. So you might wonder, is that a good thing or not? You, are you trying to be oversensitive to one out of five negative punishments, or you want to just want to be a little bit uh, slow in terms of you don't want to be overreacting the negative feedback? So in terms of, it turns it turns out that maybe in some some other in some cases having not a so high learning rate is even better because you might be learning reward slowly, but you are also not getting. Um, the, you are not treating the punishment super sensitively. So you are treating both kind of a, with a, with a uh, trade-off. You want to um, accumulate positive experiences as much as possible. At the same time, you do not want to treat negative uh, consequences. Uh, you do not want to super react to, to, to negative consequences. So this is kind of the, the learning rate. <clears throat> And with one more slide, we could have a, have a break. So what does that actually mean uh, to have a learning rate uh, with a positive large value or lower value? So this means like this. So if we are uh, changing the shape of the value update, we could write down the value of t as a function of the very initial value until um, trial number t. And then we will have this kind of term. And this kind of term, you don't know what that is, right? What you can do is you plot it. So when um, alpha learning rate equals 0.9, the curve is like this. And then there's anything in between. If alpha equals 0.3, we have uh, a curve like this. So what does this tell us? It tells us something like that. When the learning rate is high, the most recent reward counts a lot. And then all the others, trial one t minus one, trial t minus two still counts a bit, but everything in the past, it doesn't count anymore. But when we have a slow learning rate, well, the most current one, it doesn't count as much as when we have a high learning rate, but everything in the, happened in the, that has happened in the past, they carry out information. So it tends to have the accumulating experience of averaging out what had happened in the past. Okay, so it's like, um, kind of using a day, everyday scenario is like, if you have a high learning rate, then if you're in a relationship, whether my girlfriend or boyfriend is doing, treating me well every time, as long as he or she doesn't really respond to me by text message or whatever, I may be overreact. This is like, a, what, is he, what is he actually doing? This is like a high learning rate. But if you have a le low learning rate, you might be very slowly picking up your partner is, is treating you well, but once a while, occasionally, he or she is a little bit maybe in a bad mood, didn't, doesn't respond to your text message. You say, well, maybe she or she, he is in a bad mood. I don't care. I ignore it. I do not overreact it. This is a low learner rate. You see? So this is kind of over, kind of balance between the most recent one and what had happened in the past. Okay, learner rate. <clears throat> Let's break. <laughs> Let's have a perhaps. Hold on, five minutes break. Yep, that's fine. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, let's come back at 1, 16, 17 ish. Yeah. Let's yeah. Start again at 17. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. So we talked about the interpretation of the learning rates. And then perhaps you have a next question What is a good learning rate? Should I have a good, high learning rate or should I have a low learning rate? It's like, it depends on experimental design. So usually in stable environments, and it's 
kind of a low learning rate is good because you do not want to overreact to the changes because everything's stable. But if you have, a, if there is a changing environment, maybe what, whatever happened in the past, it doesn't count anymore. And then the most recent one counts a lot because that changes. So what you might want to pick up the changes uh, quickly. So then in this kind of changing environment, usually a higher learning rate is better. It really depends on the experimental design. So if you have a reversal learning, usually that can be considered as a changing environment. In that particular case, maybe a high learning rate is better. So then how is, is there an optimal learning rate or not? Usually you, can, you could be able to find it using a stimul, a simulation. So in one example, I will just quickly, I don't want to go to the detail. In my example, we had a, a, a autism work and comparing the, the learning performance in this kind of two-armed bandit task between the ASD autism, uh, uh, autistic individuals and the TD typical development individuals. So we found out there is a difference in terms of the learning rates. So the ASD individuals, their learn, learning rate is higher than the TD learning rates. But how to explain this, right? So then we, what we did is like we did a simulation and we found out there is a optimal learning rate and the ASD learning rates is much more away from the, post, from the optimal learning rates and the TD learning rate is closer to the optimal learning rate. So in other words, ASD individuals, their learning rate is less optimal relative to the TD. And then this difference is also uh, corresponding to the behavioral uh, results where the TD, they, they make more correct choices than TD uh, than ASD individuals. <clears throat> so then there, there's the next thing because um, we talked about there is the cognitive part. There is also a observational part. So after you updated, you have updated your values, so how will you respond? Do you always choose the option where uh, the value is high. So if you have two options, one is higher, one is lower in terms of the value, do you always choose the one with the higher value? Or maybe do you also want to explore the other one a little bit, even though it has a lower value, right? So here we could use something called a softmax function to uh, achieve this goal. So after updating the value, you basically have two numbers. One is the value of the yellow option, the other one is the value of the blue option. So what you can do, you can just simply calculate the value difference. So you use the value of blue minus the value of yellow. And then this value difference can be converted to an option or choice probability. So the, if you have, a, let's focus on this line first, this one, the darker uh, curve. So basically the larger the value difference between A and B, the more likely um, you, are, you, are, you are choosing option A but still with a small probability, you will choose B. And this curve is, is governed by one, one free parameter. So what you can see is there is a kind of slope. This one is pretty steep in the sense that if uh, even the value difference is, well, let's, let's talk about this way. So we have multiple slopes. This is one is steeper, the other one is going down a little bit and then becoming more and more shallow. So all of them here in this line, they have the same value difference, but the probability of choosing A is different, right? According to the line. And when we have a flight line in the extreme case, no matter your value difference is, you will always have a, a random chance choice probability. So what does that this tell us? It tells us that, that how much you are basically relying on the value difference you learned from the past or basically how much you listen to your learning experience. If you think you learned is correct, you just choose it accordingly. And if, if you don't trust what you have learned, even though one is high, one is low, you might still choose a little bit uh, randomly. And uh, um, more formally, it is quantified by a softmax function. And then here there's a free parameter tau. And then this tau is basically this uh, slope. When tau is large, then it is steeper, when tau is um, zero, then this line is flat <clears throat> in the extreme case. Good. So now we have a complete picture and we are nearly uh, going to the promise part where I want to show you how to code it because we still want to do that. That's a more important part. So we have a risk of work model. We have the cognitive model process in terms of how the values are updated. 
we have a learning rate weighted reward prediction error update, where the reward prediction error is the difference between what, what you actually get and what you expect, what you think you might get. And how to link the value update to the actual behavior. So why people choose A versus B, why people choose blue versus yellow. So we could use the, the softmax function to uh, make the connection. Okay. So then um, maybe there are some more to talk about uh, before we go to the practical part. So how can you use that in your research? Usually the way to think about it is as long as you are you have some feedback in your experiment. You can use this kind of framework. There are some action, there are some feedback, observation and feedback, then the, the, the feedback or the outcome is either better or worse than the previous uh, evaluation or previous belief, right? As long as it can be better, it can be worse in a changing, in a dynamic way, you actually could be able to use this kind of framework. So there are like, uh, uh, work. I don't want to really go to the detail, but you can click on the link to look at how people are using different variations of this kind of framework, action, outcome, learning, and then repeat the simple structure to uh, design different and interesting experimental experiments. Another question can be, well, can you do this in a social environment? You can actually do this, yes. So matter is like here, uh, can you have a dynamic learning rate? Because in our case, we assume this is a learn that the learning rate is static throughout the entire environment. But maybe you also want to have a changing dynamic learning rate. Um, um, yeah, a changing one. It's also possible. Then you have to change your model a little bit to quantify how your learning rate changes depending on your experimental stimuli, depends on time, depends on whatever uh, input you have in your experiment. And then uh, is some some other question is like so if you are doing fear conditioning you don't maybe have observation you don't maybe have choice data you present people a symbol you either shock them or not there is no choice data just passively observing the the the, the, the stimulus but then you, you usually you have other measures right you have SCR skin connections data or some other pupil dilation data then yes, you can actually use um, skin connections data or pupil response data to be the data instead of twice binary data to, to use risk plus Wagner. But uh, if you have no data at all, then it's not possible. <laughs> you need to have some data, choice or something else. But uh, you need to have something. You need to have at least something. Otherwise, it can't do model fitting, right? It relies on data. Good. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. good. Cool. <clears throat> now I will move on to the implementation part. The experiment is the same. So we have, let me repeat a little bit. Yeah, here this is fine. So we have a, a hypothetical one person, one single participant. And each trial, there are two choice options, blue, yellow, one, two, one, two. And the people, the participants make a choice, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, and then get a reward, either one or negative one, okay? So this is the experiment. And we want to model the risk of Wagner using the Stan uh, language. So the entire um, material is already in the, in the link I sent to you earlier. Wait, okay, this. Work. Um, I think I need to, uh, to open it again. I got lost, but I'm back. <laughs> okay. Oh, 
Okay, anyway. <clears throat> Okay, so I, I can do this without being in the correct path, doesn't matter. So um, we want to have, um, we want to code in STEM, right? So the very first step is we know our experiments, we have our data, let's say we have already data somewhere, we have the choice data, one, two, one, two, outcome data, one, minus one, one, minus one. So then now we are in the stage of modeling it. We want to do it from scratch. So then I created an empty script in this case. Can you see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, cool. <clears throat> can do it a little bit. Um, water. Yeah, so the, the first thing is first save it as a stem um, file extension. We can say, well, my RW enough so dot stand so here we whatever you name it you have to have a stand file extension so in jax you save it as a text file that's fine and then our jax will recognize it it will be a jax model but instead we can save it as a dot stand file so then it will be changed as a stand script you can see here the logo is also changed usually if you create an empty r file this is an r icon right and then now because it is then R Studio recognize then it will become a stand um, icon. Good. So what do we do? So we 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 say that stand is a block based language, and then there are multiple blocks, and then the order cannot be changed. Um, the the first important one is basically data, right? So we just give the name. We let's say we call it data. Here we want to define what our observations are. And secondly, we have parameters. Here we define what are our free parameters in our model. You see that when I'm typing it, it, it the, the color also has changed. So this is also a good indication that if I have a typo here, I will immediately visually recognize that this is not right. I have to check the spelling or anything. So that until it becomes the correct color I am uh, used to. But it depends on our theme. If you use another R theme, it might not be orange, but it will be a different color. So the very last one is the model, right? So here we define the, the core, the needs of the model, the likelihood function. You could also write down some comments. So writing down comments in STAN is double uh, hash. So here we say define uh, our data. And then later we can say, well, define our three parameters. And then here uh, the model slash like the put option. OK, good. We write down all of this. And then now we have to declare what data do we have. We have one participant. So maybe the number of participants, number of subjects, this variable, we don't need it. What we have, we have multiple trials, right? So we have, depends on how you call it in your data set. These names has to be named identically to what you had in your data set. So as there's R, folder, R, part, R, R, R script, there's a stand script, However you call the data in your R script, you have to call it with the same name in the stand file. Otherwise they cannot recognize each other. So let's say I already named it. I already named everything in the R script, R main function. Now I just carry over what I named in R. Now I name it the same in the same fashion in stand. So I have n trials. And I also have twice data because this is one person, we have maybe 100 trials and the one, two, one, two. And uh, we have uh, reward or outcome data. And the other, in the R main file, I called it reward. Let's just use the same name. Okay. So you just write down the empty block and then give the name how the same way that you named it in your main R function. And then here, there are some differences you have to uh, pay extra attention to. First of all, each of the line, you have to terminate it with the semicolon. So this is always, this is always. 
this line you don't have to terminate it because that doesn't make sense. But here, anything in between the curly brackets, you have to give a semicolon. Otherwise, you will receive an error. <clears throat> this is one thing. And second thing, well, the, the semicolon is easy to remember, right? You just it becomes your second habit if you uh, do a lot of the stem modeling. It was every time you will write a semicolon to uh, terminate a line. So uh, something that is a little bit trickier to 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 learn in the beginning is that each time that you declare or introduce a new variable, you will always have to specify the type of the data. So type here means is that continuous data? Is that discrete data? Is that a vector or is that a matrix? Is that an array? Is that something like a simplex, if you know what I mean? So in this case, number of trials is an integer, right? Positive integer. So in R, uh, in R stand or in stand, we have to use this one. So integer to specify this is a integer. Twice as well. So we have one, two, one, two, twice. And the reward or outcome as well, minus one, 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 one minus one, they're integers. And uh, there are something else we can do, it's, uh, it's optional. You don't have to, but you can do. So let's say I at least have one trial, right? You could have a lower bound of the variable. And then your choice, because we know that our choices are only one and two, then we just say it. Because maybe during for, for reasons of typo or whatever, in your raw data, what you give from R to Stan, one, one, one of the trials, you have a three, but then three doesn't make sense at all. This is to make sure this will not happen. Because when Stan is loading data from R, it will try to check if your data complies with this kind of um, constraints that you specified at the beginning of the data block. <clears throat> So for a sanity check, let's say. And then what we have for reward is the same, lower minus one and uh, upper positive one. Okay. So for, 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 for the people who are, you are, who you are watching, you don't have to type with me because we don't have enough time. But uh, later, if you want to practice, you can just watch again and then to try to type yourself and then to have a experience about um, coding is that good i think this is for now looks good we have number of trials and we have number we have the choices we have the reward but one thing here is like well how many trials do we, how many choices do we have we have the same number of trials as the uh, number of trials right so if we have 100 trials we have 100 choices so here we have to give a dimension because we don't have only one tri twice we have multiple choices and the same number as what we have uh, for n trials <clears throat> as the variable. This one the same because the number of choices has to be the same as the number of rewards. Each time we have a choice, we will have the corresponding reward afterwards. So this have, they have to match. <clears throat> and then, then that's, the, that's the data part. Okay, makes sense, kind of. And then in the parameters block, we do something rather rather similar. So here we basically have to define well, our parameters. We have two parameters, if you remember. So one is the learning rate. So the learning rate weighted pr reward prediction error, how we use prediction error to update our learning. And then the other one is the tau, which is the softmax, the sigmoid shaped uh, the slope of the sigma shape, the softmax function. Similar principle apply here. We have semicolon, semicolon, then to terminate each line, and then we have to give the type of the data. Uh, they are not integers, they have to be continuous variable. So here, learning rates is uh, real, this one also has to be a real. Again, uh, we could also give the range, so the learning rates by definition, actually, it is a number between zero and one. Then we could also do a similar one <clears throat> for the tau. So it also has to be at least positive. So theoretically, the tau parameter, it doesn't have an upper limit. So it's like when the tau is high, it's like this. 
when the tau is low, it's like this, right? When tau equals positive infinity, it basically becomes a step, step function. So theoretically, we don't even have to have a upper uh, limit for the tau parameter. But for practical reasons, actually, it's better to have a upper limit, so a large enough upper limit, so that it doesn't go to convergence issues. Issues. What we can do is like 20. 20 for this kind of learning task is, is quite large already. Usually uh, from uh, empirical work, tau is one point something, two point something is already, those are the typical ranges. Rarely it's above 10. So 20 is a safe upper end. <clears throat> then um, after uh, defining or declaring the data and the parameters, we can just basically go to uh, the model part, right? So in the model part, what we write is pretty much the same as what we write in R. We can write a for loop because we have to loop, we want to loop um, the trial from the first one to the last one. We loop it from one to the end trials. And then the syntax of the for loop is actually the same as in R. The only distinction is that we still have to use semicolon to terminate it. Otherwise it looks identical to what we know in R. So for loop in the curly brackets is good. And uh, so uh, what do we have in the model? We have a prediction error calculation, right? Prediction error equals what? Equals uh, the, what you actually get reward per trial, right? We have to give the trial index and then minus um, the V, <clears throat> the value. Good. This is not correct. I will change it later. And then after having the reward prediction, what you can do, we do value update. So we say the value equals uh, the old value plus the alpha, right? Multiply the PE. Okay, this is what we have. So here you can see that I'm already using the overwriting uh, feature of the language. So it will be overwritten by the new one. So there's the V. <clears throat> but uh, we don't have one V actually, we have two options. We each trial have one value of the blue option and one value of the yellow option. And which value should we update? So we update the one of the chosen option, right? Because if you choose it, you observe the outcome. If you don't choose it, you don't know what will happen. So usually uh, people do is like, we will use the chosen value twice. Here, this is a place where we use the choice. Choice is one, two, one, two. Then it, is, it serves as an index to indicate the chosen option, right? <clears throat> to, to indicate the chosen value. And then here we can do the similar, we update the chosen value according to the associated reward prediction arrow. Yeah, this is pretty much the structure of the model. It's not yet finished. So we introduced at least two variables here. We introduced the PE, right? And then we introduced the uh, V. Those are not defined earlier. So then what we have to do, we have to declare it because as long as you introduce something, you have to declare it also with the proper data type. The PE is what? PE is just this number, right? It is a scalar continuous. So PE, semicolon. And V, we use it to indicate one V of one is the blue, V of two is the yellow in this way. So we can, we, we do it as a fact vector, vector, vector of two, um, Input elements. So it's, it works like this. I have to explain this a little bit. So in Stan, we have to distinguish row vector versus vector. Vector is by default a column vector. This is what we have, V. If we define it as a row vector, it will be horizontal. Okay, one, two. So here we use the, a, a, a column vector. <clears throat> So then it will be like, we could write down some comments. Um, you could imagine V of one is blue, V of two is yellow, okay? 
And the indexing is the same as in R. It doesn't start from zero, it starts from one. So also using um, the, the square bracket. So it's the same as what we know already in R. This is perhaps a little bit new, so vector. <clears throat> good, good. And uh, then there's still something missing. So we had a softmax part, right? After each value is updated, we have to use the softmax to make a choice and where or how to declare uh, the softmax function. So it's like uh, the, the Bernoulli, so what is the, the actual data we want to model? What is the observation? We have choice, right? We want to model, we would like to model our choice per trial. And then this one follows some uh, distribution. So if you use the, if you have used the JAX before, this kind of softmax thing, you can use a, a distribution called categorical distribution. So here it follows the same um, uh, logic. We can still use a, a categorical distribution and then with the trace probability. And then how trace probability is calculated? Well, trace probability is calculated using uh, soft, max function when we have to give the value okay so this line we are changing the value to one for blue one for yellow to choice probability the, the probability of choosing blue and the probability of choosing yellow and then this one the choice will be following a categorical distribution with the p okay action probability Good, then here we can write down something. Well, soft max action prop. Then the other one is action um, twice likely. Good. Okay. <clears throat> this um, pretty much concludes um, the entire model. There's still like one thing is missing. So here is like, we need to have an initial value. So at the very beginning, we de defined that value of blue is zero, value of yellow is also zero. And then according to the outcome, zeros, two zeros will be updated. So here we will um, just <clears throat> repeat zero twice. So that's um vector <clears throat> so that's um it is also a vector okay good and it's tries to complain something in trial doesn't exist maybe i have a typo i think trials okay with s any questions oh yeah here it, p is a new variable that we i wanted to yeah. ask that yeah sure of course yeah uh-huh and the priors? Ah, Wolf has his hand up as well. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I was sure. wondering about the uh, the tau. You don't, you just, you define tau, but it's not in your model. Uh, yes, I, I was missing it. Yes, thank you. Very good point. Yes, <laughs> tau is here. <laughs> you have to multiply that with the value. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Something else. Oh yeah, this has to be a vector uh, because v is a vector. Right, two numbers. So the p also has to be a vector of two. The, the dimension has to match. So R is nice, a stand is kind of nice enough so that we can like see some error messages. Yeah, okay. The complaining is gone. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, the, okay, and the, more the, questions? Yes. Yeah, the complaining is really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually complaining is not so cool, but in this context, it is. <laughs> yeah, that that's makes sense. Yeah, because the, if you actually run it, the, the same message from the complaint will be show in the, in the car console. So if you see here at the right, right hand side, there's a check button. If you see my cursor, it's it's like if you write your thesis or paper, you will want to check your English or Dutch grammars. And uh, the same thing, it will check the, the stand grammar correctness for you. But my is just slow. Okay, now, now we can have some discussion. Any questions here? Does it make sense?
I would think it will work. <laughs> Everything's all right? Okay, good. Yeah, it is beyond slow, so. Maybe some 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 tips, perhaps. Um, usually, honestly, I don't write this way. I don't write this way. I, I write this way. So I write twice. T is following a categorical logic. How P. So this line is equivalent to this tool. So that I, not, not, not PV, sorry, V at the value. So this line is equivalent to this tool. And uh, to the underscore logic part basically does the softmax. <clears throat> but this doesn't change the efficiency of the sampling. It's kind of a style thing. And I personally prefer this way. But uh, if you do it at the beginning, you really want to make sure every step you do, you understand what is going on. First of all, converts action value to action probability with the tau. And then the choice is following the action probabilities with a um, categorical distribution. So we can write this one alternative coding. Let's end it out <clears throat> for now. Thanks. And like Francis mentioned, don't we need to specify priors for alpha and tau? Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Very good question. So um, it's like when we are writing this way when we are giving the lower and the upper end at the same time it's implicitly prior implicitly give a prior uh, r with a uniform with the lower and upper here zero one the other one zero and <clears throat> Yeah, in this case, when you do have both lower end and upper end. But in some other cases, if you say, well, you have a regression model and I just have a beta slope parameter, I don't have a range at all. So then it's better, it's, it's required to give a prior distribution. And the place to define the prior distribution is um, in the model block. So here in this case, hypothetically, we can say, well, beta is maybe normal is uh, centered at zero, but large variance and not 50, for instance. So here is the place where you uh, declare the, pr uh, the prior of the parameter, <clears throat> also with this tilde sign. So the, then, the, normal, yeah. the normal distribution works with variance is not precisions here. Uh, yes, this is variance, standard deviation, standard deviation. Oh, yes. Standard deviation. This, yes, this is a good point. Yes, yes. In the, yeah, yeah. It's not precision, it's not the inverse. <laughs> it's standard deviation, as we okay. usually understand it. Yes, yes. Yeah, brilliant question. Yes. This is cool. Yeah. And uh, there might be a question. So, can we do the declare here? I'm not sure anymore, but I think it's not possible because it, it will complain. Because you in a model block, every block at the beginning is for the variable declaration. So you declare whatever you have. And after that, you can do something else. So the declaration always has to happen at the beginning of the block. Otherwise, it won't work. <clears throat> Good. Are the default or implicit priors, are they always uniform or does it recognize, say you would use a, a standard deviation as a free parameter? I know mm. someone has been suggesting specific priors for that or those build in. Yeah. Do you stand, the, or? In, in this way, if you have both or lower and upper end, it will be uniform. If this is only one and I think there's some default, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's better you just really give an explicit prior. Right, and those override the defaults I can, I, I imagine. Yeah, yes, yeah. In this case, it's like this. So in our case, let me just re remove the beta part. So in our case, what, could, what we could run is like, we don't have to run, but what we could run is um, alpha 
follow ini from Solan then how follow this yeah, we could write it a little bit redundant but uh, if we really want to write it we write it in this place yeah, after the declaration and then here we have uh, we, we, we give priors all personal if not uniform if let's say we have a learning rate zero one but we want to have a peak around 0.3 for instance and then we could use the beta distribution and then this is the place we say you know beta something uh, five times for example some random example here things for example yeah <clears throat> And say if you would want to give the tau a normal distribution, but truncated normal that it runs between zero and twenty, can we then just write it's, tau uh -huh. being yes, normally yes. distributed and it then then yeah. automatically yeah. with spectral constraints yes. you yes. define yes. earlier? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. I will not open the new R because you are doing it here. And if you say here normal tau mm -hmm. normal zero something. It will mm -hmm. be automatically truncated between zero and twenty because these two lines, one, two, mm -hmm. these two lines work together. We don't have to mm -hmm. have a small t to say zero twenty. Okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Good. I have five more minutes. So what you can do next, um, if you are, if you are, like want to run it, there's a main R script. I'll try to maybe show you. I'll show you from somewhere else. In my text editor. So this is an R file. So here, this is the data list. Those are the data variables we have. This has to be the same as the one we have in STAN, right? In the STAN model. And then we tell our STAN uh, where the, the model file is. So here we have to change because I called it my underscore RW. And those are the MCMC steps or like samples, how many samples, the, the, the length of the chain, let's say 2000. And how many chains do we want to run together? Uh, 4000. And then the warm up is like the, the warm up the same as in the R in the in the Jax um, burn in that's a word so the same as the burn in concept so here by default Stan uh, recommends using half of the sample to do the burn in and the thinning as I mentioned earlier because that's efficient enough you don't really have to thin it if you want to thin it you can change the variable but default is one those are some helping messages it doesn't really matter and uh, the core part how to call Stan from R is use the function stan right so the function name is called stan it takes multiple input arguments file scripts where the location the path of your stan model data is the one you have it and the number of chains number of iterations and uh, then the warm up burning and then thinning and then all of the four chains do they start from random starting points yes so random starts and then after that to save it and then i also have included some plotting function you can also try to uh, play around a little bit this plotting functions, I believe, it also takes RJX objects. So if you want to take plot the traces, posterior densities, so it's all, all possible. <clears throat> I noticed you didn't specify initial values. So I guess it's not needed, but is it possible? No, not needed. Yes, yes. I yes. did so random, yes. yes. OK. No. Yes, here you could say, well, I have maybe for alpha uh, point 0.3, and then for tau. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you could. Yes, yes, yes. It's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Usually, I'm happy with the random ones. <clears throat> but if you have some really strong idea about how to specify the initial values, you are really welcome to do so. Two more minutes left. Maybe I don't count finish everything but uh, maybe briefly. So those are the plots. If you want to try it at home, you could have like a trace plot, density plots, nothing new here. The, the same what you have in JAX also works here. Same understanding, same interpretation. 
And uh, then the idea is like, we have example of one person, but maybe we want to code everything into, into a hierarchical fashion where we do not uh, fit, fit the parameters as if this is one person or as if all of them are independently. We want to consider that the people, they may be follow, they come from a common um, distribution, the populational level, and we have the hierarchical structure. And coding that is a little bit tricky, but conceptually you basically add, so those, this is the graphical illustration of the risk of Wagner. They have alpha learning rate, the tau of max temperature. We basically have to, to introduce, we could introduce the group level mean and variance using a normal distribution and the group level mean and variance using a normal distribution for both of the two parameters. And then we are able to have a hierarchical version of the model. And practically it might be a little bit tricky and there are, there are indeed some tips and tricks. So then this is the, 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 the motivation I mentioned in the beginning already. So we had a package and we tried to code uh, as much as many models as possible in the field, at least learning and decision making. And I also teach course like at my university here in Vienna. So there are like YouTube videos online. You are, you are more than welcome to, to watch. More topics, I will just mention the name. You can Google the terms later if you don't know what they mean. So posterior predictive check, whether the model prediction matches your data pattern and the parameter recovery, whether the parameters can be recovered from themselves, whether you could be able to identify the parameters and the model recovery, if you have multiple models, can the models be identified or recovered by themselves? In other words, do models make correlated predictions or they make uh, dependent, independent predictions? Are, mo are models distinct from each other? <clears throat> and then some readings, including some work from my, my own and my, my colleagues and the collaborators, some tutorials in this direction and some empirical works, how to use it in an experimental setup. And then some books, I guess you are familiar with, then more places like online uh, Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter, Twitter accounts to, to follow. And then, yeah, this is the main message. Don't let it fear you. Just try to make, make, make mistakes. Yes, please. And then learn from the mistakes, risk of Wagner, <laughs> to improve uh, the, the competence of coding instead. And then if you get confused, don't worry, because you are trying to understand something, then you, your confusion will be solved in the future. This is it. One minute is more, but I guess we are on good track. So thank you so much um, again for the interest. That's it. No, thank no, you. No, no. Thank you for uh, this interesting uh, uh, two hour lecture. Um, yeah, I think it, uh, to me, it was very, uh, very clear. And, and, and I hope that also holds for uh, the people in the audience. I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so thanks for your willingness to do this. Yes, yeah, same here, Lee. Thank you. I also learned how to deal with my, uh, with my wife if she doesn't respond to my messages. So <laughs> it's a life lesson. I uh, didn't expect to take away from this, but. <laughs> You're That's a good one. Just your learning rate. Yes, <laughs> you have dynamic math. <laughs> um, I have to go because I have to go to another meeting. But but uh, yeah, so I'm gonna leave you if if people want uh, want to stay for a couple of minutes. Uh, well, it's basically lace room as well. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But um, thanks a lot. Uh, and yeah, thank you, thank you again. Yeah, hope to visit Lumen one more time in the future. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. I hope we can see each other there. Yeah. Bye. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.